There it is. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Thanks for joining us today, um, this afternoon. Um, this is the Sony Cine Alta session, um, where we will talk about um, Sony Cine Alta, Sony Venice cameras, and obviously how, we, we are, how they are used. Um, we are very happy that um, Sony Venice has been uh, adapted by many cinematographers around the world. Um, we have um, received feedback from DOPs, DITs, first ACs um, in post-production for producers that are all uh, like to work with Venice and we have incorporated many um, features based on their request. Um, so we are happy that Venice has been adopted to many known productions um, around the world, just to name a few, um, the Black Widow, um, sex education, um, the crown, um, as an example, the father, two of us, um, antlers, um, up, upcoming, obviously, uh, Top Gun 2 and um, Avatar, that I'm I, actually I'm looking forward to see next year. Um, and today, um, I'm very happy to welcome um, here in Turun uh, with me Rob McLachlan, um, ACCSC. And thank you. And also with me um, on stage, Braden Haggerty, um, underwater DOP and operator. Good. So from from them, I would like to hear direct first-hand feedback on how they um, experienced Venice, what they could do using Venice, and. Um, Maybe even um, uh, some, some background information, obviously. We will do um, a questions and answer session after a first introduction and first um, discussion between us. We are splitting up the, um, this afternoon's uh, seminar in two. The first, one, th the first part is about Lovecraft Country that um, Rob has shot. Um, and the second part will be about um, both of their experience with the new Venice 2 camera. Um, maybe some of you have joined uh, yesterday's worldwide announcement that we did from here, from um, Camera Image in Turun. Um, and uh, we will get some, we will have a little bit more time to speak about details and uh, background information. Good. So, starting with uh, Lovecraft Country, Rob. What was the, maybe you can describe um, a little bit of um, the, uh, the, the, uh, what this show is about before we show the trailer. Uh, Lovecraft Country is based on a book of the same name, um, which um, wanted to turn H.P. Lovecraft's uh, legacy a little bit upside down because he was, he was uh, while he was almost the original horror writer in America, um, he was also notoriously racist. And um, this very genius young writer named M Misha Green um, took this on and adapted it. It took a very long time to uh, get to pilot. It took a very long time from, for the pilot to then be turned into a series. In fact, um, uh, it, it, it um, just, as, like with any new series, it, it, it always takes a while to, for a show to find, figure out what it is and what it needs to do. And, um, my mandate um, going into it was to, first of all, complete the pilot, which had been um, only about 60% um, finished uh, when we started, and then to do um, several more episodes together with a fellow DP by the name of Michael Watson. Um, the, one of the, obviously, the, the show is set in 1955 in Chicago um, during the Jim Crow era of racism in the US. Um, and it, the show had many goals, one of which was to portray African Americans doing Indiana Jones type of stuff, Goonies type of stuff, um, um, and, and, you know, adventure stuff, James Bond almost kind of, kind of adventures, um, on a big screen, in a big budget show, and, um, and, and, to, and to just, and, 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 and very directly deal with a lot of the, uh, the very important racial issues facing uh, the U.S. these days um, by also um, 
giving Americans a little bit of a history lesson about some of the uh, racist atrocities that happened in their history, which are not taught in the history books. And actually, I think a lot of Americans learned about things like the Tulsa massacre and what have you through this show by um, you know time traveling flashbacks and what have you. So it was a, it was it was I was I was immediately interested in it when I read the script and, uh, and, and saw what they had shot so far because it was so, it was just not like anything I had ever seen before. And I left the show I'd been on for uh, several years uh, called Ray Donovan, which I loved shooting, um, to do this because it was, it was, it just looked like an, an amazing challenge and a chance to do something really important. Great, thank you. Let me try to um, run the uh, the teaser trailer. Um, actually, just before this event, we have not able to to, to test the audio, so um, let me check that this is working. I hope this will run. Give me a second. Oh, here you go. That doesn't work, but I hope that I can will be able to put that onto the big screen. Jesus, that's huge. Uh, let me switch that to a different mode. Give me a second, guys. Maybe that's easier. Here you go. Okay, let's hope that the audio is, is working. I love stories. Heroes go on adventures in other worlds. Ah, here you go. To fight surmountable odds. Stories are like the living thing. My father. He wrote me, so he could have a secret legacy, a birthright that's been kept from us in Lovecraft country. Bad thing. It's not real. You sure? They don't like outsiders at all. I found more than a few stories about travelers being attacked in the surrounding woods. By what? through trials and tribulations. Why this world is haunting us? It's like the devil. The American dream. Depends on it. The question, what is reality? What is reality? I guess. Um, yeah, it was a very long production. I think I started, uh, we started it and I think I started prepping in April and we didn't finish until uh, the holidays that year, later in 2019. Um, and of interest, it was the first project that I photographed on Sony Venice and um, I was just, the, every day shooting this show, I was happy that I'd made this. I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to make a shameless plug here, but um, it, 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 it really impressed both myself and my fellow DP, Michael Watson. And one of the things that um, I knew was going to come in handy was the, the larger format, working on a larger format, the ability to put things out of focus in the background because we were, although we had a, a very healthy visual effects budget, you know, there's always limits. And um, uh, when you're dealing with a period piece, this, you know, this being 1955, obviously there are a lot of anomalies in backgrounds and what have you. Um, it's sometimes nice to be able to just make them out of focus and save the production vis effects money, paint, you know, rotoscope money that they can better spend on 3D animation or what have you. Um, one of our mandates um, uh, from the showrunner was that she she didn't want it, us putting a patina of you know 1955 photography on it. She wanted it to feel. Um, she wanted the photography to disappear, which which 
jibe with my aesthetic as well. So, you know, we didn't play around with the image. We didn't, we didn't add grain. We didn't do any of that kind of thing. We wanted it to be as clean as we could and just make the, the photography disappear as much as possible. But while at the same time satisfying her mandate that the cast look amazing all the time. And um, one of the things that struck both Michael and I when we did our first test with it was how incredible um, faces looked. And we had scenes with like the most alabaster white people in them together with some very dark skinned African American actors. And um, I, Michael and I looked at each other and high fived each other when we shot our first tests with it um, because we knew it was, you know, what has historically been a, a, a a bit of a conundrum for cinematographers under those circumstances was not going to be an issue. Um, the other thing I did um, toward, uh, toward having our actors look as good as possible was I've learned just in, a little bit in the hard way um, that people look better still lit with clean tungsten light where there's a burning filament and you know they're full spectrum. I, 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 I have, as much as I love LEDs, um, just while you're, wh whatever you see here, um, know that like most of the close-ups I did on Ray Donovan and most of the close-ups I shot on Game of Thrones and other shows were lit with a Dato Octodome with a thousand watt um, tungsten bulb in it because I just, I have never found anything that makes actors look better than that or even a, a, sometimes I, I'd rather use a, a China, a China, a, a, a rice paper lantern with a hundred watt bulb dimmed down in it to uh, to light them with. So that's just a little aside on the lighting of the people in this. And 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 again, um, Misha was adamant that the cast look fantastic all the time. Um, in 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 the aim of you know just having us connect with them as well as possible. So the, the versatility of having different skin tones. Um, yeah, uh, captured as natural and beautiful as possible, basically, right? Exactly yeah. right. And and I've never been happier with how close-ups looked than I was on this show. I was like, I was every day. I went home happy, and um, and the actors loved me, <laughs> which is always a good thing. And um, uh, you know, and, and that that's just strictly in terms of how the close-ups look. And obviously, close-ups are a, are a cinematographer's bread and butter, really. Um, but the camera also worked really well. There, there are a huge amount of visual effects in it, and the, our visual effects supervisor, Kevin Blank, loved the fact that it was 6K, even though we were only going to be delivering in 4K, because he knew he'd be able to zoom in, he'd be able to shoot plates on the same camera that we were shooting the show with, and he'd have tons of resolution to play with. And also, um, we were framing for 16 by 9 because contractually that's what they had to do because that's what the pilot was done in, although given our druthers, I think we would have been two to one. Um, but even then, by by keeping the uh, whole sensor clean, um, it, if, if, if there was any bouncing or reframing or anything to do, it's really nice to have that north-south uh, uh, capability. I I noticed in some shots you used, uh, used a lot of torches and of course a lot of low light scenes in, in during the night how did that that behave how did um, that work? yeah well this is another place where where uh, we found the camera really shone um, holding detail and torches and you know I'd lit lit many many scenes on Game of Thrones with just torches or candlesticks and what have you and and typically what happened then and and this is quite a while ago um, you know, you lost all the detail in them and, and, and the richness, and often if it was egregious enough, they'd have to spend money to have the visual effects department, you know, help it out so that it didn't just look burned out because um, that, that frequently was our only light source. And we were working on this show. It is a horror. Uh, you know, it's a, a genre-bending horror, albeit with some science fiction elements as well. Um, and... Uh, um, so we, you know, we were working in very, very dark environments much of the time, and uh, and and it was really fun to work with, just just to be able to to quickly reduce the amount of light that we actually uh, had to use on any on any given uh, scene. You want to play one of these scenes, sure, maybe, um, um, and talk through them. Um, we have here. Diana runs away. Sure, let's try that one. Good, let me try to run that. Uh, 
This girl, this little girl, has had a curse put on her, and these these uh, characters, Bopsy and Topsy, uh, start to pursue her. This is a 100% CG Chicago subway train. He coming back? I don't know, Diana. Go inside. Call your uncle. Tell him you're here. Wait. Letty. What? Behind you, there's, there's. <coughs> you okay? Some water from the kitchen. I'll be back soon. So, um, you know, hor hor horror in daytime is, is always uh, dangerous, but, um, you know, y y y and there was discussion about, you know, from the studio level, wouldn't this be better and creepier at nighttime, but um, story-wise, it wasn't going to work, so we kept it in the daytime, and um, we, I, I felt like these two characters, especially... Uh, shooting them with a, uh, you know, cheating a little bit with a, a 45 degree shutter to make their movements a little bit more uh, creepy uh, would do the job and the scene worked, ended up working very well. You used also a mixture of um, a high frame rate shooting in there. Um, how did that work? Everything with Venice, right? Everything yeah. with Venice, yeah. yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, we, yeah, we, we, we with the, the skipping rope, um, I can't remember what frame rate that was. But we uh, we maxed out while keeping it. I can't remember what my max on 6K was, but um, it was it was definitely enough. Perfect. Good. Um, okay, let's open up the uh, show for, floor for any question that you might have. Lovecraft Country, how Rob shot this. Any questions that you might have? Over there. 
How did you work in the image pipeline, in color grading? Uh, did you do any special tricks? Because I experienced Sony to be special in that department. Can you talk about it a bit? I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't, I, I didn't how get did, that. How did, did you work in uh, image pipeline and color correction? Like from the beginning on, how did you develop this workflow? Uh, did you do any special things, uh, LUTs, whatever? Um, I had a, I had, I, I, I like to do on, on set live uh, grading uh, while I work. So I, I have a couple of wonderful DITs that I work with and, and um, we, I try to get the look as close as I possibly can on set because often you're still shooting or you're on another project when the final grading is happening. So I feel like I, I'm, I'm usually pretty good at, at, at finding the look on the set, getting it as close as possible as we think it's going to look at the end. And if nothing else, at least it gives the grader a very good starting point, which speeds up the grading process. And I find the nice thing about that is that it then gives them time to do all the little tweaks and, and sweetening, maybe some, you know, more power, more time to play with power windows or if, if there's any need for vignetting or anything like that, um, it, it, it lets us sweeten it up a little bit more down the line. So really that was, that was basically it. And um, again, we weren't, uh, we, we weren't looking at, you know, applying any particular heavy look to it. We just wanted to be as clean and natural as possible in any of the period element um, was going to be inherent in the very good production design on the show. Please. The question down here. Sure. Um, in this scene, you showed us like the protagonist is having like this white dress, but also like uh, pitch black hair, and I thought like. Uh, what is your recipe like in protecting these highlights and the blacks also? Like, was the dress, for example, not 100% uh, white, or was it like darker? the dress? Was, the dress was slightly tacked down, but and 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 um, you know, it used to be much more of an issue than it is now. And I found with this camera, you know, if, if you know a, a, a bright white shirt slipped through, uh, it wasn't a disaster like it would have been a few years ago. Question up there. So, um, which lenses do you use for the production? Um, this production was shot entirely with Zeiss Supreme Prime lenses, usually with um, a, a light Hollywood Black Magic filter on it to uh, just just give it a little bit, uh, just, to, you know, to take a bit of the edge off and to glow the highlights a little bit uh, in, a, in a slightly more natural way. And one of the things I find with, the, I, I, I love the Zeiss Supremes, but uh, uh, if, if, if you're um, stopped down with them at all and you get a very bright highlight, which you would have seen in the uh, in this Venice 2 uh, video that we did with the sun through the trees, um, you get a, a a very pretty but not always very natural starburst sort of effect. So you need a little bit of diffusion with those lenses, I find, to to sort of wash out that specificity of the uh, of the, of how they react to a, a pin source of light. And uh, no zoom at all. Pardon me. No uh, zoom lens at all. Just um, uh, primes. We had we had some of those lightweight full frame Zeiss zooms, but we only ever used them sometimes if you know on on a steady cam if we we didn't you know, where rebalancing quickly was an issue or on a techno crane, I used them. But as much as possible, I tried to stick with the Supremes. And then they, you know, we found that um, the ACs were very quick at changing them over. The switch over time is, is, is you know, very qu faster than the hair and makeup people can usually touch the actors up between takes. Um, and I also like the fact that they're T15, uh, which you know, and and which is a wonderful combination together with a high ISO capable camera, and the built-in NDs. It's 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 a perfect triumvirate of tools to so that you can maintain your depth of field as you change. If you you know if you go from a 29 millimeter to an 85 millimeter, obviously your depth of field changes a lot, but you can keep it very consistent thanks to the speed of those lenses, the speed of the camera, and being able to very quickly adjust uh, uh, an ND, which, uh, I mean, I think most of my fellow 
DPs I know who work with them. David Franco, who shot Perry Mason with it, is just a fantastic looking example of what the Venice can do. Um, that's our favorite. That's that's kind of our favorite feature, really, apart from apart from the fact that they're very fast and clean. Okay, thanks. So the eight eight stops of um, or the eight Ds that I build in, you use them um, even um, yeah in, in any kinds of shots. Even even at you know frequently at night because yeah. the camera is so fast and street lights are so bright these days mm -hmm. that um, often I found myself you know if I, I wanted to shoot with a fairly shallow depth of field often. Um, especially with a horror genre where you want, you know, lots of dark spaces, but also areas where anything could be lurking that you can't see. Uh, and uh, it worked very well for that. Maybe that scene, for example, where that could yes. be... Mm. Yes. Okay, okay. But um, so in, in that scene, you, I guess it will be, it was uh, 2500 uh, dual base ISO that you used. Um, to, to be honest, I... Uh, I had enough resources, and I found that uh, I would use the base 2500 ISO, mm -hmm. but then I would rate it at 1250. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I I didn't other than some day ex, you know the day exteriors when I rated it at 500. Um, almost I would say 80% of the show is the camera is set at 2500 base, mm -hmm. and um, and then exposed at 1250, which I found cleaned the shadows up quite a bit. And this was one of the things I like testing uh, that I looked very hard at, at with the Venice 2, which is that even, and now even at 3200, I don't think I'll have, to, I know I don't have to do that anymore. I don't need to sort of put that little extra exposure in the shadows. And mm -hmm. that's almost, it's something I did with, with other digital formats as well to, uh, to keep the shadows cleaner. Just, I, I, and, and it goes back to my days when I was shooting 16 millimeter and I wanted it to look like 35 millimeter. I wanted it to be as clean as possible. So I always overexposed it a little bit. And I found that that actually most of the time, if that's what you're after, um, works well with digital cameras. But again, um, the Venice 2 really, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't believe I'll have to do that anymore because it, the, the shadows stay so clean and um, the, the latitude is marvelous. Yes. Hi. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I've noticed you using two different color temperatures in co on close-ups during daytime. Uh, what's your reasoning for that? Did we? I don't. Uh, or was it was it just me? Um, it could have been the screen. I mean, this isn't a very high resolution we're we're watching here, but um, typically, I didn't play around with color temperatures too much, other than um, there's a scene that was in the trailer where there's like something coming under the ground towards them. Um, that was a scene that was all supposed to take place at dusk, and the ADs originally wanted to do it at, uh, at night because they didn't see any way we could shoot the whole thing at dusk. I hate working at night, so I said, let's do it in the daytime, and we'll use, we're already in the woods, and we'll use smoke to blot out the sun, and, um, and, and in that case, I, 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 I rated it at 4,500 uh, Kelvin, but the rest of the time, I just stayed right on 5,500 or 3,200 and tended not to bounce around. But the, uh, the 45 worked great um, for creating an evening look, and it was, you know, it was just right. It, wasn't, it didn't feel false, and everybody, you know, it took us all day to shoot that scene. Um, but, uh, and in fact, at the end of the day, we actually lost the light, and we, we were shooting real dusk by then, and again, we, 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 at that point, we bumped from 500 ISO up to uh, 1250 ISO, but um, kept the, uh, the color temp the same. Thank you. Welcome. Shall we play the, the second uh, clip? Okay, let me just uh, try this one. Hope that works. Here you go. Get your fucking hands up! Hey! I'll take your fucking hands up! 
sorry for that. Maybe this is <laughs> enough for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you mentioned before to me that um, this scene at the beginning was a good example why it does make sense to work with the uh, full-frame sensor because uh, you have these this extra shallow drops of field. Right. I mean, here this was a good example where a couple of these shots, um, you know, we, we as as it was, we were uh, we 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 uh, wore out our welcome in this small southern U.S. town. Uh, and they decided they didn't want us, they just pulled the plug on us filming there anymore. And um, so we shot the stuff toward the house, and this is a real house that was built during a Civil War era house. Um, but we couldn't look the other, at the other side of the street, and we couldn't look down the street because they, uh, they wouldn't let us close it off or, or, or modify it to uh, look more period. So um, the, the easy solution was to reduce the depth of field and you know work with the lenses almost wide open so that it was more out of focus, and then in the end we had to, uh, everything everything looking the opposite side of the street was created on the studio back lot against a, uh, against a green screen and they created the, uh, they recreated the environment uh, after the fact. So perfect example of uh, that it does make sense to, to work with full frame. It, 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 full frame is, is definitely um, the visual effects department's best friend and um, and the visual effects department, if you're smart as a cameraman, <laughs> should be my best friend because um, you know it, it 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 really pays to have a good relationship with the as opposed to an antipathical one with the visual effects department because um, we can really help each other out a lot. And you know I know of I've, I've known of DP vis effects relationships that uh, were not good and nobody benefited from it, and certainly the film doesn't. But um, and, and just as an aside, when I was uh, color grading the Venice 2 footage, test footage that we did, I had Jim Rigel, who's a three-time uh, Oscar-winning visual effects uh, supervisor, come in and look at it. And he was, I mean, I mean, he was so excited about the fact that it had substantial uh, resolution and also uh, uh, the, the incredible dynamic range. Um, and and these, these things all help all of us because we have to work as a team when we're, when we're doing something this complex. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, any last questions on Lovecraft Country before we move over to Homecoming? There's one question down here. One, one. Oh. Uh, you mentioned that you like the tungsten light uh, on actor's face. But what is your actual approach? Do you build a whole set uh, based on the tanks and light, and you uh, balance your camera to uh, 200, uh, 3 to 100? Or do you build the daylight setup, have your camera balanced to daylight as well, and just add a touch of fill uh, using tungsten to bring out the, the colors? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if we're daily, daylight balance, I'm not using tungsten to light the actors with. I'll be using, you know, I'll, I'll use something else. Um, and, and, and in that case, often, um, uh, LED, but uh, anything in the studio, we were 100% we were tungsten balanced and, and just worked everything to that level, even if, in, and, and would add the, our blue in later. Uh, but for instance, uh, we had a lot of big built sets, and um, we used uh, sky panels for all our skylight, which I like to keep a little bit on the, you know, obviously keep on the cool side, but then any of our sun and what have you pushing through the windows, I like to use, I like to use old school. Uh, 10 and 20 Ks because I, d I haven't found an LED that can duplicate that feeling. Um, and you know, it, I'm not saying that every single close-up was lit that way because we were using a lot of Asteras that, were, that we could, you know, we, were, we had a lot of very um, tiny, small sets that we had to, you know, work a little bit of illumination into. So I would use uh, uh, the battery-powered Asteras that are very quick to pop up and, and put in, but we would uh, sometimes, um, even though the, you can change the color balance on them, as we know, uh, sometimes we would add, we found it more flattering to the uh, actors if we added a little bit of uh, CTO gel to them on top of that. Thank you. Fine, thank you. So let's move to uh, your next production. Well, <laughs> just a recent production that you, both of you did. Um, called Homecoming, um, which is one of our two um, videos that uh, we ask um, uh, two DOPs to do. 
um, Rob Hardy, um, BSC, um, ASC uh, that we showed yesterday, and uh, you, um, who have done um, this, uh, this piece called Homecoming. Maybe you can talk about the, the background of why you called this homecoming and what your intention was. Well, my, my intention with it, uh, you know, my first thought was this is a great opportunity to, uh, to make some really gorgeous images and, and sort of do what I do on a daily basis on set with big crews and a lot of equipment and what have you. But, um, and then I realized, well, that would be making a demo reel for me, and what I really need to be doing is making a demo reel for the camera. And to that end, I wanted to do something that was, I, I, you know, I, I sort of returned to my professional roots as a, as a documentary cinematographer and um, I wanted to, but at the same time I wanted to do something that was at least a little bit meaningful to me so I also returned to my sort of spiritual uh, home where I, where I did, you know, grew up to a large extent which is a very beautiful island off the southwest coast of British Columbia in Canada uh, that's inhabited by uh, a lot of artists in various uh, medium and also home to uh, some scenery that I knew that no professional film crew had ever filmed before. So I wanted to show the camera in, uh, basically give it a, put it through a torture test and try every, you know, just throw every, every natural condition that we can't under normal circumstances control and see how it handled it, including extreme contrast. And if one of the reasons I kept it in 3-2 aspect ratio was to hold the sky because there was a, there's a lot of really beautiful things happening with this camera in the highlights and, and we kept the sun in the shot as often as we could so that we could assess how well the camera handled that. And, um, you know, we, we were really impressed with how the highlights roll off now. And I think if there was any complaints about the original Venice, uh, it, was, it was how it handled highlights. And I think they've been really well addressed with this camera. Great, thanks. Um, now, I'm, I'm not sure if we can roll uh, Homecoming. That doesn't work for my laptop, unfortunately, but does it work? Can we try? Thank you.
So, so um, that was shot with Zeiss Supreme lenses with, and Fuji Premista zooms, no filtration. Uh, we used, n I, had t I took none of the things that I, for 30 years, have been accustomed to having, which is, you know, includes three 40-foot trailers full of lighting and grip equipment. I had no lighting people. I had no grip people. Uh, we didn't add any, you know, I had to resist the urge to add fill light and bounce. Um, because uh, I, I, I just really wanted to see what the camera would do without any help, and um, what I, what I, the conclusion I came to was it doesn't really need too much. Um, uh, what else did, did we? Um, for me, indeed, uh, it looked like a torture test. It, that, <laughs> that was that was the idea. It was a torture yeah. test. You know, holding the sun. Um, yeah. You know, blazing hot kicks on the water. Um, Definitely, I don't think you can probably see it here too well, but in the color grading suite, um, the, the amount of nuance and detail in the clouds and um, unlit faces against uh, hot white skies uh, that you get up there, which have you know, been, a, been a problem forever because I've, I've shot up there a lot, um, was not an issue. I mean, we kept detail in the, in the faces with, without any artificial help whatsoever. And the scene in the house, um, they had you know, pretty inadequate domestic lighting. They had some. They had some. They had some track lighting and one tattered uh, Chinese in the middle of the house. One tattered uh, rice paper lantern that I did. I cheated a bit and moved it a little lower to get into the eyes. But that was that was it. Um, it, it couldn't have been simpler. It was. It, it, this was shot with a camera, and that's it. Great, and actually, um, I hope that th this is what you you guys want to see, because indeed, bringing this through a test and showing what the what the capabilities are without any heavy uh, post production is what you want to see. So, uh, Braden, um, the underwater shoot that was a difficult one. Um, I I understood by um, because the weather was bad. You had nearly no time, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, as, as usual, the underwater portion was the very last portion we shot on Hornby Island, which is always the case. We had, we had five minutes left for underwater. Um, but I kind of laugh when you say it was, you didn't want, you just wanted to use a camera, but the, an aerial, aerial drone, steady cam, <laughs> underwater. Um, and we, uh, anyways, so in the underwater, that camera worked really well. In terms of physically, we were able to, to manipulate it in the short amount of time that we had to get it prepped, as well as for the other elements that we used. But in terms of shooting underwater, we're usually in a dark environment. Most cinema, I'm usually camera operating and working for a, a cinematographer like Rob, per se. Actually, I've worked with Rob a lot of times. And usually in the underwater environment, it's darker, and there's no sort of um, practical life sort of source from underwater. It's usually just something that's coming from the surface and most cinematographers would like to not use anything underwater and having a sensor like this in the Venice with that higher base, uh, th that higher ISO will, makes it easier. So those scenes were just, there was no lights as said. It was overcast so it was darker and our waters are very dark. It's, that is actually how it looks exactly. It's that green by eye and it, I thought the camera handled it really nicely. And you, you were, it, it was tough because you had uh, no time to, to uh, go down and, and prep and, and go down. I think the whole thing was shot in within 20 minutes, you yeah, said? Well, I, I calculated from the time we left the dock, the, the dock with the boat, mm -hmm. got to that little spot where we shot and got back. It was about 25 minutes. Just not the drone stuff. The drone was separate time. But it was a pretty quick little, little shoot. And the cam we didn't have any issues with the camera. Right. There was no yeah. overheating or, yeah. or yeah. anything like that. Yeah, okay. Um, and um, uh, yeah, th so for you, um, the, the ability to have this as a, a small compact uh, camera, which has um, the ability to record internally, um, the, the form factor is an important thing for you. Heat, form factor. Um, well, with, uh, with the housing that we're using, yes, it's, it's good because the camera, the weight of the camera as it is right now, mm -hmm works really well in the housings that I work with. They're Hydroflex housings, they accommodate, I know there's some underwater people in here, they accommodate pretty much any camera, like a Aerie 
cameras, the Venice, the other Sony cameras. So I knew when Rob wanted to do the underwater, the only housing that would probably be ready to take the Venice 2, which is, wasn't even on market yet, would be the Hydroflex, which was the case. Um, and so the weight, no, so the, and the weight was perfect. It was, if it was any heavier, it makes it really harder because I probably have to add buoyancy to the housing so it's not mm. to balance it. And feedback in terms of uh, Steadicam, um, you work with the, a very um, yeah, a Steadicam operator that has uh, years of experience, right? Yeah, I, I, I work with probably the most experienced Steadicam operator in the world, David Crone, who, who did his last Steadicam job for me. And he, he owned Steadicam number three 45 years ago and has done 150 or so features and many other projects as well. He was, so it, suffice to say, he's, he's used every single professional camera since then on his rig and he loved working with this camera. And I, the, the other thing, Braden brings up a good point. We wanted to, uh, you know, uh, demonstrate that you can, here's a camera that you can shoot day to day, uh, any big production with, you could use it. I think. I think you could use it on a documentary because we just did. I think you could use it for, uh, you know, big IMAX type work because I know our, our helicopter pilot wants a couple of them right away for his, uh, for the IMAX work that they do. Um, I wanted to get some big aerials in there. One of the, uh, one of the requests from Tanya Lyon, the Sony uh, marketing person on the West Coast was to, you know, Open it up, make it big. Let's 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 see what this big sensor can do. So, that's what took us up there. Um, but I do get, you know, there there are um, there were some beefs about the size of the uh, original Venice with the R R7 recorder on it on when when it came to flying on drones. And because you could do it, but it did substantially reduce the flying time. I had this amazing uh, drone uh, outfit doing our work uh, in British Columbia, and they found that uh, the flying time was much uh, greater than they were used to, thanks to the light weight of the camera. Then, um, moving into um, some of the desert scenes, like moving away from British Columbia, unfortunately, but uh, maybe in, the, in more the uh, warm weather conditions, and um, the harsh light of the, of the desert, especially when you, Braden, are moving out of the um, garage, um, into the desert. You were speaking about that. Usually you would um, fill this up in the garage. Yeah, I mean, every, every, every shot that I put in this, you know, it, 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 they look simple, but I was struck by, you know, the shot of the front of the house with the car parked in the garage. Um, the, the, the contrast range there was extreme. We were in the desert and there was no fill in the garage other than what was, you know, what little bit was bouncing off the driveway. And we didn't have to add anything. I think normally my, inst you know, I, I wouldn't even have to ask for it. I, we, if we were setting that shot up on a, on a typical production, my grip would have a, a 12 by bounce or something out there to open up the garage a bit with. Um, we didn't need it, and um, I think I think going forward, I'm going to have to keep reminding myself that um, we can we can simplify a little bit, and 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 it'll get us closer to my constant goal, which is for the lighting and the photography to feel as natural as we possibly can under the circumstances. Good. Um, any questions from the audience? Please, you have already I'm a microphone. Ahead. Is it working? Yes. Um, I have a question for Braden because uh, I'm really interested in underwater um, operating. And this might sound like a nonsense question, but you said that you didn't have time to prep. So I'm assuming usually when you prep, you know, uh, when you go underwater, you have to check for a few things to be safe. Um, so you can't rush that. Um, what, what do you check with the camera when you go underwater? You talked about the weight of the camera. What else? Okay, so actually I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to go back to the fact uh, that, that, that practically the camera was um, behaved really well for us considering we didn't have prep. We received the camera at the, the camera assistant, this woman that works with me, her name is Kim. And Kim received the cameras at 4 p.m. on a Friday and at 6 a.m. Saturday we were on the ferries to go to Hornby. So she had a prep time of 4 p.m. to uh, 10 p.m. that night, which is six hours. But she had all these different, uh, the Steadicam people, uh, Dave came with his Steadicam and he had to fit it on there. So, and then she had the underwater housing, she had to make sure it fit in the housing. Uh, 
So when, with the, with the housing, um, oh, sorry, and then also the drone people came by and wanted to see it. So she really didn't get the cameras for herself. She was helping everybody else. When the camera goes in the housing, you need to make sure it's just all the cables and parts are there, that the lenses aren't vignetting uh, with, with the dome port and things like that, uh, that all the cables work. It's, a, it's quite a big system, the Hydroflex system. But is there anything that you have to, sorry, do you have to check on the water? Like when you go down, do you need some time to prep while no, you're down there? Sometimes a little bit of a cheat before we left the docks, we balance the camera. So every time you put a different camera in there and a different lens, it, the camera sits different in the water. So I like it to be neutral and flat in the water, but you might put it in the first time and it's back heavy. So it's, it's floating, but it's sinking that way. So you add some weight to the front and now it comes down at levels. That's Sorry, I was just going to say one of the things that made uh, allowed, you know, just a few hours of prep, whereas normally a can an AC would, would get, you know, potentially days, uh, especially with a brand new camera. Uh, the fact that it was so similar to the original Venice, um, everybody was very familiar with it. So it was just a matter of, it was really just a matter of, um, you know, making sure we had all the right bits and pieces for our particular purposes. Yeah, it was an easy crossover. And I, I like, was really relieved by about six o'clock, Kim called me and said, Drone people are happy, steady cam's happy, and it fits in the housing. And that's pretty, that was pretty quick to figure those things out. So that was, that was a good point for the camera, for sure. Thank you. Good question. <laughs> Any other questions? OK. Then I do have one. Um, um, you, you mentioned this before that, the, again, this possibility of losing some light and using more natural light. Um, I come back uh, actually to the same question that I had yesterday in terms of um, in the car when Braden was um, driving through the desert and having um, to fill it up with some light from the outside. Um, this is not necessary anymore, or? No, I mean, I was amazed um, th that, I, and again, this was another you know, more of our torture test. Um, you know, we were doing shots where we were panning off a desert at midday into a figure driving a car with no, uh, you know, with no fill light whatsoever. And it felt very natural and the, flat, the skin tones looked very nice. Um, contrast ratio felt fine. There was just, because there's so much underexposure latitude, we'd be exposing for desert, harsh desert sunlight. Um, but uh, there was still plenty of plenty of plenty of room in the negative, so to speak, to to uh, hold the detail there and not feel lit. Then another thing that um, you mentioned yesterday was this um, scene in the wood in the in the forest. <laughs> Please. Yeah, the the shot uh, walking through the forest, which was one of my favorites. Uh, what we didn't realize, and because we were working so incredibly fast. Um, the drone operator had to go in and fiddle to get some cables out of the way that were that were hanging up that hadn't been then attached properly, and in so doing, he accidentally m bumped the ISO from 800, which we were working at, down to 200. But we didn't realize that until we'd moved on to our next location and um, went back and and played the material back and saw that it was quite heavily underexposed, and um, I was you know pretty alarmed at it. We got into the color timing suite, and boof, what you, it, and w this was in there. Um, it would, it would, I don't know if it could have looked better if I'd properly exposed it or not, but it, it, it really impressed myself and the, uh, and our colorists who, who um, picked up e even more stuff than I did in little details that he was not used to seeing. Um, and a couple of times, for instance, the highlights on the, on the ocean, he thought, uh, he thought there were, there, there, were, there were glitches in the video or something. And in fact, it was detail in those highlights that, uh, that we absolutely didn't expect to see. Um, then another question for me. In, indeed, what, what you, uh, this end scene where Braden is on the cliff and uh, the drone is just um, panning around and looking at the, um, I, I think this is sunset, right? Yeah. It was actually sunrise. Sunrise. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, for me, the, uh, the 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 details and the the, um, the dynamic range in that scene is phenomenal. Um, it, it really is incredible. I mean, you know, so it, we're doing a 180, and I don't know if I mentioned, but I didn't do well. I, I, we we did no stop pulls. We did no dynamic adjust uh, exposure adjustments in post. Um, I, I kept it as clean and honest as we could because, of, of course, these days it's very easy to cheat, <laughs> and I didn't. 
and, and, and I do it all the time, but I didn't want to here. Thank you. So, um, any questions from you guys? There is another question there. Hey guys, it's awesome to see that you're from Canada, because I'm from Canada as well, from Toronto. Uh, my name's Adam, uh, I'm a DP as well. Um, I just shot a feature on the first Venice, and um, I was curious, uh, I had some issues with some of the highlight roll off, but I was curious if, if, um, if you guys used any of the higher ISO um, in daytime settings just to get a bit more highlight latitude and not using the, the low end. I, I would have liked to have, but we were working so fast, you know, in, in, under normal circumstances with enough time, I'd have worked my way through a whole bunch of ISOs under every condition, both night and day, but no, we didn't. We were only at 800 in daytime and 3200 at night, but I, I, that, that's a really good point and um, something we'll be checking out. And, um, you know, I think it's one of those things, one of the things that helps us help hold the uh, lovely detail in the, in, the, in the bonfire, for instance. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks, Chris. Perfect. Any other questions? There was, yeah, there was one over there. Hi, I have a question about the underwater shooting. Um, how often do you prefer using a fill light in natural environments like lakes or the ocean? Of course, in comparison to a pool, you would probably have, have it way less, but what, what warrants uh, a fill light for you personally? What warrants a fill light? Yes, for, for the underwater um, uh, shoot. I, I seriously try not to use any because it, it's, it's really hard to do under natural conditions and not have it feel lit. And even in tank conditions, if you're doing, you know, I, you know, I recently did some night work in a tank and um, the underwater operator on that particular production wanted to put some fill lights underneath and um, it, it just looked completely artificial. So I try to keep everything coming through the top as, you know, I think as Braden mentioned earlier. Um, sometimes uh, cinematographers will, like I've worked on a show, Siren, that we talked about earlier. And uh, visit, the visual effects needed just needed a little bit of a boost, and so we did we did use fill in that case, but tried to make, not have it directional, like just like it was coming from nowhere. They just you just needed some more in the faces. So if we were using if we've been using a Venice, we weren't um, that could handle that better. Then then we could have got away from that. The other problem is the particulate in the water when there's particulate, and any time you bring a light in it that um, can become problematic. In terms of uh, green screen for underwater, sorry, I'm just going to ask another question. Uh, for light refla uh, refractions uh, on the backdrops for green screen, how do you uh, counteract that? Um, you know, a lot of, I, I've found, on Siren, we use black screen the whole time. And it's just with the green screen now, because it's not like the old days of film where it had to be all even and it was, it was the whole material had to be flattened out and everything. Now it, 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 we find we're usually in a tank where we have kept the water quite clean, so they we can just we just light it with whatever uh, fluorescence or there's these 5K lights that you can use to light them. So it's that it's not really a big deal. And then at the point where you get to you're dealing with a lot of particulate in the water, it's probably disappeared anyways. You're not even seeing it anymore. And that's where a larger tank is probably more beneficial than a smaller one, uh, if used with uh, special effects. It's always better. The bigger the tank, the better. <laughs> this is usually our motto. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Any, co any other questions? Okay. Rob, in, in terms of... Um, yeah, the kind of the ultimate question in in the way that um, if you compare this, you have years of experience, obviously, with with uh, working from eight millimeters, sixty millimeters, thirty five, all the digital cameras. Um, so this Venice too, and and looking also at the, all of the experience you have on Game of Thrones of um, these epic, huge scenes that you shot. Um, so what would Venice 2 would have enabled you to do? Um, I think the, one of the things I love most about the larger format is, is the more cinematic depth of field. And, and, you know, if you're extracting 240, 
Um, you know, I love anamorphic lenses, but I hate how long they can take to uh, to deal with it, whether you're just changing them, ch you know, changing lenses or uh, working on trying to get close focus or what have you. So. Um, having this bigger sensor and then extracting, say, sh say for instance, shooting with Zeiss Supremes, um, you still get that very, you know, potentially very deep cinematic, uh, uh, or very shallow, rather, cinematic depth of field with it. So I, I love that about it. Um, I, think, I think that also can make it more engaging and involving for the audience. And, um, yeah, like you say, I've 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 worked. I've I shot my first film when I was 15 years old with a wind-up eight-millimeter Bolex. If anybody knows what a Bolex is, this was an eight-millimeter one. I worked my way up from there. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I've worked with every professional camera since then, and I'm not exaggerating when I say uh, Venice 2 is the best camera I've I've worked with, and I will be as soon as I can get my hands on one. It's it really is good. Congratulations. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any last questions before we close? Oh, there's one up there. Uh, hello. I'm just wondering if you if you find any correlation between the the shooting format and then eventually what the viewer will see the the final product on, which is like in TV shows, usually a smaller screen. If you ever like consider that when shooting on a larger format, and if there's anything that is specific to the larger format that maybe uh, doesn't really translate on a smaller screen. Um, I yeah no I don't um, I, I I think you know you know there's always been some discussion about whether or not. You know, if you know you're shooting for just strictly for a theatrical release, and you know what that was going to be, or if it was only going to be shown on televisions, and and then what kind, and you know, who, and, and whether it's Dolby Vision, so that it, the you know the picture is going to be consistent or not. Um, you can't please everybody. It's like the old days when 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 you know drive-ins were drive-in theaters were still around, and and the the producers wanted a really bright picture because the screens were so big. If you made anything very dark, nobody would see anything. But you could, you know, that was like you know lowering the bar. And what you ended up with was was something that didn't really look good on anything. So I think what I always do is just try to. Um, get it as right as I can on whatever I'm looking at it on on set, knowing that um, you know it's going to translate. Um, however, it's going to translate onto whatever you're watching it on, even if it's off of a laptop and a screen. And I couldn't really see the screen today. I'm, I have no doubt that um, there was a great deal of mi information missing from, especially the Lovecraft Country material because it's so downrest. So, I, I, you. you you, you just have to set the bar as high as you can and please yourself on set, I find. Thank you. Good. One question there. You already said some things about comparing the Venice 2 to Venice 1 with the roll-off and the highlights and the ISO ratings. Is there anything else that you experienced uh, difference-wise? I don't know, color, science or whatever? Um, the one little thing is that uh, we we all found everybody I I, th I think who who tested it found that it was um, shifting a tiny bit towards magenta, which is one of the worst things to have you know in, when you get to the color suite. Um, but these are our prototypes, and Sony's promised that that's going to be fixed by the time the camera comes out. Um, so you know that 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 literally was the only thing, and and it's a pretty minor quibble. Just to say that we um, both productions uh, were done on really early prototypes, um, with without any major issues apart from potentially uh, this one. Uh, but uh, uh, please bear in mind that it's still a couple of months before we will release the camera in February. Um, so there's still uh, the engineers are working on this to um, extend the camera, make it better before the release in February. Up there, the question. When you told us that in a certain situation you rated the camera as uh, 1200 uh, ISO, actually it was uh, 2500, uh, 
that leads me to the question, do you use your personal light meter to check the illumination <laughs> as we have done it before always? I, I do actually, and I brought my meter out. I, you know, often once I've been shooting with a camera, you know, day in and day out on a particular production, the meter doesn't come out often, but I did bring my meter out with this camera. Um, and when I say, you know, when I say I was, I, I put, because it has the dual bases, I had the 2500 ISO base, but then you can dial it down and say, okay, it's 1250, which it, it just, like I said before, I always like to have a little bit of a comfort factor there um, to, in case, for instance, what happened with the ISO uh, on the, um, you know, something goes wrong, you know, it's just a, a little insurance policy, so to speak. But yes, and I did take my meter out, and I had um, Tim Nagasawa is a marvelous DIT with me, um, and I put my meter out and set the stop, and it was bang on with what his waveform monitor was telling him the exposure would be. It was like spot on. So I tended to use my light meter more and more. And we were working so fast, we couldn't always you know, be connected to a waveform monitor anyway. So yes, if I had to go out with this camera and, just, and no crew and just a light meter, perfect. So it's great to hear that you are somebody still using the light meters because sometimes I'm wondering, when people say, oh, I cannot start lighting the scene because the monitor is not connected to the camera. Exactly. Or the camera is on the truck. Right? It's, it's incredible. Right. But, uh, just to finish, you want to have very clean shadows, clean blacks. Are you not afraid? I always have been very anxious about uh, the blown out highlights on the other side if I give that extra uh, exposure as we always have done in, ne in negative. Right. Um, that, that's one of the vast improvements with the, with, the, with the Venice 2 is how well it holds on to those highlights. And if you, ha you, know, if you had a chance to see this in Dolby Vision on a, on a, on a, a good OLED screen, for instance, um, you would see you would see nuance in the sky that you know even in uh, there there was so much in there when I got into the lab that we didn't even know was there. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it just it just it just kept on delivering nice surprises. That's one of the beauties of uh, shooting in linear 16-bit XOCN. Uh, that you can, you have everything in the highlights, in the in the lowlights, and you can simply dial it in if you if you want, without having the need of the the huge data rates because it's a, a reduced data rate um, recording format, but still 16-bit linear. And actually, um, just to say that, um, of course, we used better versions of the uh, raw viewer and um, a software when when we did this shoot. Um, but uh, what I heard so far with uh, from um, uh, Baselight, for example, uh, the production with Rob Hardy worked smoothly even in 8K. So running the, the content smoothly in 8K, 60 millilinear XOCN data. Good. Any last question? Fine. Then thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Robert Glachin, Braden Haggerty. Thank you very much for your incredible um, a passion about this, the whole project with the very tight um, timing under difficult condition, difficult weather. And thank you for coming to, uh, to us and joining us here in Turun at Kama Image. My pleasure. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Emocjonujących wrażeń życzy Energa z Grupy Orlen. Sponsor strategiczny festiwalu Energa Camera Image.